We will now uh, welcome our third panel of witnesses, and we thank you for your uh, patience with us this afternoon. Uh, from my left to right, your right to left, Mr. Jack uh, Laserson, is that close? General partner of the Vertical Group, a leading venture capital firm, uh, Dr. David uh, Golahar, close. President and CEO of the California Healthcare Institute, and Dr. Rita Redberg is a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and the chief editor of the Archives of, Eternal, of Internal Medicine. Uh, pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses uh, will be sworn in before they testify, so I would ask you if you would uh, rise and lift your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Uh, I will recognize uh, the witnesses for their opening statements uh, in the order in which I introduced them. So we would start with Mr. Uh, Laserson, and you uh, are recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Jack Lasserson, and I am testifying today on behalf of the National Venture Capital Association. During my 30 years career as a healthcare venture investor, our government has partnered with entrepreneurs to safely speed innovative new devices to market. Over this time, the U.S. became the undisputed leader of global medical innovation. Americans have been first in line for the life-saving devices that U.S. companies produce. And throughout this period, patient safety has always been paramount, and safety must continue to be paramount, even, if, even as we strive for the next life-saving innovation. Although revolutionary research is ongoing, fewer groundbreaking medical devices are making it to the U.S. marketplace, and those that do make it are taking longer and costing significantly more. At the same time, other countries have emulated our successful model and have begun to draw innovators and capital away from the United States. And as a result, we are starting to see stagnation within the U.S. innovation ecosystem. A growing body of research suggests that the performance of the FDA has played some role in this decline. For many entrepreneurs, the FDA process has grown unpredictable, if not inscrutable. Working on very short resources to fulfill a broad set of responsibilities, FDA personnel struggle to keep up with their workload. This research shows that re review and clearance times for medical devices has significantly increased since 2007. U.S. medical innovation is beginning to, to migrate overseas, and patients in foreign markets are, beginning, are benefiting before American patients without a corresponding gain in overall U.S. health or safety. The central problem is that the FDA's risk-benefit analysis for novel medical devices, as well as drugs, has grown out of balance relative to its past practices and to current practices in other countries. FDA now weighs risk too heavily and demands unreal unrealistic levels of assurance of benefit, particularly for first-generation therapies. As you know, under current law, all medical devices and drugs must be, must be both safe and effective. But in medicine, safety does not mean the absence of risk. It means a reasonable insurance, assurance that the probable benefits of using a device exceed its probable risks. Effectiveness requires that the benefit be cl clinically significant, which means it must produce a clinically meaningful improvement in the health of a significant portion of the population. We believe that the FDA should establish as a guiding principle a more flexible risk-benefit analysis. This means that while the general requirement for safety and efficacy will always continue to apply, the specific threshold for each element within the equation will change depending on the clinical context. Incidence and severity of disease, urgency of need in the marketplace, prior medical knowledge, and the, relatively safe, and the relative safety of a device should all be considered to explicitly adjust the variables in the safety and efficacy equation. These adjustments might include, for example, reducing the level of evidence required to provide a reasonable assurance, or what constitutes a, quote, clinically meaningful improvement in health, or what portion of a population is deemed to be significant. The flexible safety efficacy paradigm that we are proposing is already implicit and maybe even explicit at the heart of current FDA law. We already have very different review standards for low versus high risk devices. But research data suggests that this is not being applied correctly or uniformly. 
A legislative mandate would help FDA senior management implement this common sense principle more broadly within the agency. In addition, the FDA should continue to measure probable benefits against probable risks instead of an emerging practice of requiring a higher absolute level of evidence of benefit to ensure against a hypothetical or possible risk to health. Medical breakthroughs begin with only a small advantage over the status quo and then dramatically improve over time. This has been true for the past 50 years. Angioplasty is a perfect example. Requiring that all novel products initially demonstrate a high absolute threshold of benefit versus risk will derail many promising new ideas. For devices with low to moderate potential risk, the FDA should significantly expand the use of certified third-party entities for review. As the research suggests, this practice is widely used in Europe without sacrificing safety, and we continue to believe in the safety and efficacy standard. We are also advocating, advocating for a number of broader reforms, and amending the statutory mention, mission to include acceleration of novel ter therapies to the marketplace, ensuring that individuals with significant expertise can sit on advisory panels, and streamlining the regulation of cross-cutting innovation, including a pathway for personalized medicine, are very, very important. If we act now to implement reforms that bring the FDA risk-benefit equation back into balance, we can revive the U.S. medical innovation ecosystem and ensure that seriously old patients continue to have access to breakthroughs, breakthrough therapies and technologies in a safe and timely fashion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Lazerson. Uh, Dr. Gallagher. Thank you, uh, Chairman Gowdy and Ranking Member Davis. Uh, my name is David Gallagher. I'm the President and CEO of CHI, the California Healthcare Institute, and I appreciate the uh, opportunity today to address several important issues concerning the review and approval of medical devices by the FDA. My testimony is based on a recent report CHI produced with the Boston Consulting Group, BCG, called Competitiveness and Regulation, the FDA and the Future of America's Biomedical Industry. One major theme of this report is that the FDA is a de facto industrial policy, for better or worse, and its operations shape the future of the medical device industry. Now, history shows that a strong science-based FDA and well-articulated, predictable, and consistent regulatory processes are essential to medical device investment, innovation, and patient care. Unfortunately, in recent years, there's been a significant deterioration in the environment for medical device innovation. Beginning in approximately 2007, evidence clearly confirms that regulation of medical devices has become increasingly slow and unpredictable for both 510K as well as more complex pre-market approval, PMA products. As documented by the FDA's own data in our competitiveness and regulation report, comparing 2010 with the period from 2003 to 2007, uh, that's the period of the first medical device user fee law, we note two things. First, that 510K clearances have slowed by 43 percent during those two periods, and that PMA approval times have increased by 75 percent. Clearly, part of the problem for this slowdown lies beyond the direct control of the FDA and its leadership. In recent years, for example, Congress has enlarged the agency's scope into new fields, like tobacco, and added to its responsibilities and authority. Yet Federal appropriations have largely failed to keep up with new mandates forcing greater reliance on industry-funded user fees. But perhaps the most important factor in the agency's recent history has been a change in its culture. Faced with accusations from the press, from consumer groups, and some in Congress that its reviews were too lax and failed to protect public safety, the FDA has shifted emphasis in product reviews from benefits of new devices to focus increasingly on their possible risks. Meanwhile, Outside the FDA, another form of a risk has darkened the prospects for medical technology investment. Beginning in 2008, the Great Recession devastated investment portfolios, including the pension funds and institutional endowments that historically have been the main source of life sciences venture capital. Against this background, levels of regulatory uncertainty, delays, missed timelines, doubts about eventual approval, uncertainty that was uncomfortable in good economic times became intolerable after the economic downturn. 
especially because investors and executives came to realize that there were practical and more efficient routes to the market outside the U.S. Today, complex medical devices approved via the PMA process in the U.S. are approved in Europe on average nearly four years ahead of the U.S., uh, up from just uh, a year uh, earlier over a decade ago. And no evidence exists to suggest that these faster approval times in Europe lead to patient safety-related problems. In fact, a recent uh, Boston Consulting Group study comparing the period from 2003 to 2009 uh, comprehensively in Europe and the U.S. found virtually no difference in uh, product recalls and safety problems. Today, Congress, the FDA, industry, patient groups, and other stakeholders can come together with a will and ideas to improve agency performance, to rejuvenate, support, and sustain a strong science-based FDA, an efficient, consistent, and predictable review process to approve safe and effective medical technologies. Critical to this effort is the need to address, through constructive congressional oversight, more appropriate balance between benefit and risk. Today, the FDA, the press, Congress, consumer groups, and others overwhelmingly focus on direct risk, product side effects, adverse events, technical product failures. But just as important, perhaps even more important to consider, are indirect risk, distortions in the regulatory process, for example. How should we calculate the public health loss to patients if investors and companies avoid entire diseases and conditions because the FDA's standards for data are so extensive and its standards for approval so uncertain? Similarly, we need to understand uh, the cost of regulation, again, both direct and indirect. As this committee and Congress look for ways to create jobs and create a more business-friendly environment, the full cost of the regulatory system should be fully weighed. As the uh, global economy grows ever more connected, American leadership in mer the medical device faces intense competition for capital, for markets, for talent, and for jobs. As these competitive forces gather momentum, Investors, managers, and policymakers ignore them at their peril. If FDA regulation is just one factor among several, it nonetheless can be pivotal. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Gallagher. Uh, Dr. Redberg. Thank you, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, and other distinguished members for inviting me to submit testimony on medical devices at this important hearing. I am Rita Redberg, MD, Professor of Medicine and full-time faculty and, cardiolo and cardiologist at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center for the last 21 years. I'm also Chief Editor of the Archives of Internal Medicine, one of the most preeminent peer-reviewed journals of scientific research in internal medicine. The journal frequently publishes articles related to use of medical devices. As a practicing cardiologist, I appreciate the advantages that medical devices offer in care of my patients every day. I also know the problems and heartaches that can occur when an implanted device is found not to be effective or has been found to be defective and is recalled. My first priority is high quality medical care of my patients. Thus, it is critical to me that any approved high risk device first has been shown to be safe and effective. Unfortunately, this standard is too frequently not currently being met. First of all, only 1% of all devices go through the pre-market approval pathway. Congress envisioned that all Class III devices, those with greatest risk, would be approved through the more rigorous pre-market approval process. However, the 2009 GAO report entitled, FDA Should Take Steps to Ensure That High-Risk Device Types Are Approved Through the Most Stringent Pre-Market Review Process, found that this correct congressional directive was not being followed. The report found that the majority of high-risk devices do not go through the original PMA process and instead are commonly approved with no clinical study data. Even the PMA process itself has been found to need improvement in its clinical data requirements. The gold standard for clinical data is randomized controlled trials. Yet our recent study that was published in JAMA found that fully two-thirds of PMA cardiovascular devices were approved on the basis of only a single study. Moreover, only 27 percent of these studies were randomized and only 14 percent were blinded. Only half had a comparison control group. 
Thus, the majority of high-risk implanted devices were approved without the support of high-quality data on safety and effectiveness. For example, as chronicled in the Chicago Tribune last week, the Mixo valve, an annuloplasty ring permanently implanted as a heart valve replacement, was approved through a 510K process. This valve clearly falls within the definition for a Class III device and was originally classified as such by the FDA. However, according to the Tribune, the FDA, quote, rubber stamped, unquote, the device industry's request to downgrade from Class III to Class II in 2001. The petition for reclassification cited studies finding that the rings were safe and effective. However, none of the studies were randomized clinical trials. And there were other problems. Many of the study investigators were heart surgeons who invented the devices and had financial relationships were receiving royalties from the manufacturer. These relationships were not revealed to the patients who received these annuloplasty rings. Moreover, Edwards had sold these devices for two and a half years without FDA 510K clearance as the company had determined from an FDA document that a new 510K was not needed. However, shortly after press reports on this missing FDA clearance, the company submitted a new 510K and FDA ultimately cleared the device in April 2009. There were no penalties to the company for this infraction. In the most recent five-year period, there have been more than 3,400 adverse events reported involving annuloplasty rings, and these rings have been linked to only 56 fewer deaths than heart replacement valves, yet the annuloplasty ring went through a 510K clearance without benefit of clinical trials. This number is especially disturbing as it's estimated that only 5% of all adverse events are ever reported. Adverse event reporting is voluntary for hospitals and doctors. Manufacturers are required to report deaths and injuries. However, there are an unknown number of delays in adverse event reporting by the manufacturer. For example, last April, an FDA inspection of medical device maker Edwards Life Sciences identified six complaints of adverse events related to use of mitral annuloplasty rings and pericardial prosthetic heart valves that were not reported to the FDA within the required 30-day window. The FDA is sorely underfunded for its enormous mission of protecting the public health by assuring food, drug, and device safety. FDA device review is partially supported by industry user fees, but currently device user fees are lower than pharmaceutical user fees, even though drug trials are much more expensive to conduct than device trials. The PMA user fees pro provide less than one-fourth of the estimated $870,000 average cost of the review in terms of FDA staff and resources, thus creating a disincentive for FDA to use the PMA process even when Congress had intended its use for high-risk devices. Increasing the budget for the Center for Devices would help speed up device approvals by allowing more FDA staffers to review applications more expeditiously. But the process cannot and should not be speeded up by foregoing the requirements for data of safety and effectiveness. Finally, the device approval process has been compared to the European process, but a recent review in the BMJ found that while European conditions may be more favorable for industry, they are not necessarily best for patients. The decision-making process in Europe occurs behind closed doors. There is no publicly available reason for granting a CE mark, the European approval. The BMJ editors attempted to contact 192 manufacturers to get evidence of the clinical data used to approve their devices in Europe, and every one was denied access, stating that, quote, clinical data is proprietary information. True innovations are welcomed, but cannot be recognized as such without clinical trial evidence to show that new technologies are beneficial for patients. Only high-quality clinical trials can assure safety and benefit, especially for invasive devices from which patients incur risk of infection, bleeding, and even death. 
it is well worth the time up front to gather safe data of safety and effectiveness so that my fellow cardiologists and I can confidently tell our patients that implantation of a device is in their best interest. Thank you for your attention. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, the Chair would recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for his five minutes of questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Laser's son, um, I assume that you and your colleagues uh, help people with all of these great ideas, find the resources to develop some of the products that they manufacture and put together. Is that? We, we certainly try to, yes, sir. And every conversation almost that you have about health care, there is the whole issue of cost, the issue of liability, the issue of risk. If standards are altered, let's say perhaps downward, would that pose a problem for the people in your business? Well, we don't think the standards should be lowered, as a matter of fact. Uh, we we uh, support the safety and efficacy standard. The, the question, and I think this is the point Dr. Shearn was making, is it is the question of how it is implemented and how the agency uh, manages it. So we are not at all suggesting a reduction in the, in the standard. We are recommending, in fact, what the agency does already in some cases when it works very well, which is to, to change the balances within the, the standard. Um, the levels of evidence, for example, uh, what's what is believed to be significant, what's meaningful, depending on the context and all of the and, and other factors that may be relevant. This, the agency does this already in many, many cases. It is really the common sense uh, thing to do. I am sure Dr. Shearn would agree. It is just a question of how do we make this a consistent practice within the within the. So then the higher the standards, the more comfort you and your colleagues have relative to the likelihood of trial lawyers getting involved in your business and lawsuits and all of those kind of things? Uh, you know, we, we think there really is value in the FDA setting a, a, uh, a rational bar uh, for approval. Um, all of the points Dr. Shearn made, are, we, we agree with in that respect. It is really a question of the internal balance in the last few years, we believe, has really gotten out of whack and that the risk side of this equation has come to really dominate the culture of the FDA. Um, and we, we don't suggest the basic risk-benefit idea should be abandoned in any sense or safety and efficacy. It is really just bringing it back into balance. Dr. Golaher, part of the discussion this afternoon has centered around some comparison between what we do with our Food and Drug Administration, what is done in, in, in the European Union. Given the discussion, uh, if you had to say, let us maintain and perhaps even maybe intensify, uh, would that be your position or would it be, well, we probably could get away with uh, becoming more like them? I think that um, the idea of the FDA being the gold standard is what we should aspire to. I think that regulation can be a competitive tool, um, as it has been in the past in the U.S., and that our goal should be to make the regulatory process the best in the world, which also means the most efficient and the highest performing. Uh, I think the industry's goal is exactly that, in other words, to have clear communications on standards between industry and the agency and to uh, see a process in which uh, those standards are uh, clearly applied and, and implemented. Uh, the comments uh, earlier about changing goalposts, about not knowing what is required, is something that bothers uh, many, many uh, companies. And uh, I think there are enormous opportunities for performance improvements, many of which uh, doc Dr. Shearn and his comments focused upon. Dr. Redberg, you, you express a great deal of, of affinity for innovation and for being able to come up with new approaches, new techniques, 
new technology, but pretty much it seems to me that you were saying at the end of the day that we really need to have as much assurance as we can possibly have that whatever it is that we have come up with is going to work in the best interest of the patient and that they are going to be able and should be able to feel safe, secure, and comfortable with what we have got. Is that an interpretation of, yes. of, of what you were saying? That is correct, Mr. Davis. It, absolutely. I, as I said, innovation is you know, a great advance in medical care, but a new technology, just because something is new, doesn't mean it is good for patients. And so every new, and we have gotten to an era where we have a lot more devices and a lot more complex technology, but that means there is a lot of downside. You know, we are now we're mostly talking about implanted devices that are going inside someone's body. And so it is really incumbent upon us to know that before I recommend that device to be implanted in my patient, that I have clinical data, high quality clinical data showing safety and effectiveness. And really it is effectiveness because we don't need to talk about safety if there is no benefit to implanting that device. But, and as um, Dr. Shuren pointed out, the EU standard does not include effectiveness. But, you know, we all know, I mean, we have heard about the metal-on-metal -metal recalls, the ICD lead recalls, there was just the Boston Scientific recall a few days ago. I mean, these devices have been implanted and lead to serious adverse events, including death. And so I do embrace innovation, but it has to be shown to be beneficial. Well, let me thank all three of you for sharing your expertise with us and for your willingness to come and testify. And I thank you very much and yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from Illinois. Uh, Mr. Lazerson, if you are going to change the risk structure, are you also advocating changing the litigation structure that we have in this country? Wow, that is uh, a hard one. I, I, think, I think that litigation uh, absolutely does uh, uh, contribute to excess uh, use of, of a lot of medical technology. Um, and I think the, that is, is a factor that we really have to consider. Um, so I think uh, reasonable litigation reform is, is something to be is something to, to think about. Um, in terms of the in term, terms of the risk side of it, um, I, I don't think that the view is at all to accept greater risk in the sense in the sense that a device has no that the risk benefit is has become. Um, undesirable. The argument is that you accept a higher level of risk only if there is a higher level of benefit to balance it out. So obviously How do um, you know sorry. that balancing? Um, that is the job of the FDA and then ultimately the medical community. Um, it is the decision that a physician makes every day. Every decision a, a physician makes uh, involves some level of risk versus But benefit. the physician doesn't do it uh, for devices. I mean, physicians aren't well equipped to go do their own research, I would not imagine. So how do you uh, suggest that physicians who wind up using these products and devices, how do they balance uh, risk with uh, efficacy? So they don't do it across the board. First of all, the FDA really does make that decision ultimately, right? I mean, that, and we, we believe in that system. So the FDA is ultimately responsible for deciding that a particular device, the risk benefit is favorable, and that's why it's approved. But what a physician does is when that approval happens, it's approved for a very broad population of patients. It may not actually be an appropriate use of a device in a particular patient. And that's really what the physician does. It decides, a physician might decide that the use of a, of a drug eluting stent, even though it's technically approved for a particular use, in a particular patient with a particular set of comorbidities and risk factors, perhaps age, perhaps diabetes, other unfavorable factors, that in that particular case, the risk benefit is not uh, worthwhile to use it. So, even though the FDA is primarily responsible for this, getting, putting a device onto the market, ultimately a physician really exercises fine-tuned judgment 
about whether to use a particular device in a particular patient. I'm, I'm with you, and I've got to confess, I'm just a prosecutor from South Carolina that made very poor grades in math and science. So uh, say it's slow for me to get it. The FDA doesn't do their research, though, correct? No, but it, it relies on the research that provided right. to, to it. To Dr. Redberg's point, what in your paradigm eliminates uh, physicians who have a fiscal stake in the outcome of the research? Where would you factor that into it? Um, first of all, it has to be disclosed. Uh, the industry has taken a very, very strong position on this, that any conflicts of interest must be disclosed. Um, if they are not disclosed, that is, I think, uh, a mistake. I think it, they should be disclosed so that people like the FDA can weigh that in their analysis of the validity of the, of the data that is being provided to them. In certain cases, it may be completely inappropriate for a physician to conduct, for example, a clinical trial if they are uh, the inventor uh, of, the, of the technology and there are other alternatives. It may very well not be appropriate in that case. Uh, Dr. Gallagher, uh, let me see if I can qualify you as an expert in contrasting our system with the uh, European system. Uh, to, are you aware of any studies that suggest the recall rate is higher in Europe than the United States? No. Are you aware of any studies that indicate the uh, bad outcome rate is higher in the European Union than in the United States? No. Is the litigation rate higher in the European Union than the United States? No. Is there anything about the United States system that you think is superior to the European system? Yes. What is it? Um, I think that, uh, on balance, the centralized approach with a stronger uh, publicly funded science base is a better system than a completely distributed system. However, I think that there is some balance to be struck and that there are lessons that we can learn uh, from the European system in addition to that. If Dr. Sheridan were to go on a vacation for two weeks and appoint you the head, uh, of the FDA uh, for this section. What are the first three things you would do before he got back? We would all be in trouble. But uh, um, I think one of the things that would be interesting to know is uh, much uh, to, to gain a deeper understanding of um, what is happening in Europe. Um, quite clearly, there has been a major migration of medical technology companies, uh, of technologies invented in America that are being introduced first in Europe. Uh, there are, there's an economics of that, and we understand part of it. What we don't understand nearly well enough is the uh, taxonomy of the European system. Um, we need more information. That would be uh, a high priority, uh, because right now Europe is outcompeting us with respect to their regulatory process, and it's exerting an economic cost in terms of jobs and innovation in the U.S. The second thing is to decide which uh, things can be done immediately uh, from a managerial perspective in the agency to improve its performance. And the third thing is a corollary to that, which is um, what needs legislation. Right now we are in the uh, MADUFA uh, negotiation process. There are some things that Congress needs to uh, legislate in order to uh, uh, promote agency improvement. And we need a better understanding of what is managerial and what the leaders can do and what needs congressional support. And, of course, part of that, which Dr. Sharon mentioned, is adequ ad providing adequate resources for the agency. I think we're, we, all of us believe that that is a fundamental um, principle. Dr. Redberg, uh, your uh, passion and advocacy for your patients is uh, palpable, uh, and I would uh, commend you for that. Uh, but I think you would agree that uh, patients who uh, either die or get sicker because they are waiting on the approval process to work, um, that is not any more fair to them uh, if the delay is unnecessary than patients who um, are subjected to devices that are either unsafe or uh, just don't work. So uh, how do you strike the balance between uh, risk, which is, uh, I would imagine it is impossible to zero it out, but what level of risk is acceptable given the fact that for lots of patients, uh, time is the greatest risk that they face? I agree that we do have to strike a balance. Um, and so certainly I want some clinical data, you know, human data of benefit, particularly for a high-risk implanted device. But I think it is possible, you know, to have a, um, 
a shorter follow-up period for studies because obviously the longer the follow-up, the longer the time to approval. And I think a shorter period is fine, assuming that we have actual post-marketing data, because frequently the FDA mandates post-marketing data means we're going to follow that device for the next year or two, three years, but that data actually is not um, ever coming. And so then, it, so if we had a more robust post-marketing system, I think that the, there's less onus on getting everything up front pre-approval. Pre to FDA. And so I think we can strengthen the evidence both pre-market and post-market, kind of like the accelerated approvals for um, drugs that we do, to have that system with a real post-marketing um, registries where we follow. You know, we have so many new carotid stents and defibrillators, but we have very little data on how patients are doing one, two, three, four years later. In your testimony, uh, you stated, and others, I think, have stated today that the European model doesn't include efficacy as part of the analysis, which, for, again, those of us that don't practice medicine and are not experts, that, that was surprising, because I, I wouldn't know what else you would consider. Uh, I guess safety, I guess it can be safe and still a placebo. Um, is that what you meant by that? That's right. And actually, unfortunately, especially with devices, there is a lot of placebo effect. You know, in, for example, recently vertebroplasties, the spinal procedure for back pain, you know, has been FDA approved on the basis of a trial that did not have a sham control. A year or two after FDA approval, the New England Journal of Medicine published two randomized trials where they did kyphovertebroplasty and they did a sham control. There was no difference in the outcomes of those patients, certainly. And some insurance companies then reevaluated their approval. Medicare spends over a billion dollars on vertebroplasty for this, this procedure that has never been shown to be more beneficial than a sham control. And so it's an excellent point. In order to see benefit, especially for a device, you have to have an adequate control group. But um, what, once you've established benefit, then you know the level of risk is going to depend on the patient, the population, and I think that can be um, better determined after FDA approval when when you have widespread use. The, the other point about legal is for PMA approval, as you know better than I do, the Supreme Court by Regal versus Medtronic. Um, that is the only patient protection for patients that have PMA devices. They cannot sue in state court um, for Regal versus Medtronic for devices. Um, I think we all agree we don't want our capital, uh, our jobs, our companies fleeing the United States because our system um, is second rate, uh, nor do we want to trade uh, safety for expediency. So um, thank you for helping. Uh, educate the committee, the subcommittee, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you again. I appreciate again your patience as we uh, had to vote and go through two other panels, and I applaud your, uh, your knowledge, your acumen, your professionalism, and your civility towards uh, one another and to the subcommittee. Uh, anything else, Mr. Uh, Davis? No, sir. Uh, with that, uh, the subcommittee hearing is adjourned, and I will uh, come down there and thank you. Uh, the hearing is adjourned.